there have been several treaties signed at Fort McIntosh and at Fort Stanwyck and at the mouth of the Miami, but they had been the specific tribes. They had covered uh, the Iroquois Confederation, they had covered the Delaware, and uh, hopefully the Shawnee at the mouth of the Miami, but that hadn't worked. And so they decided to try for another uh, treaty at Fort Harmer. They also tried for one at Duncan Falls, and somebody got a little bit trigger happy, and nobody ever really decided who was to blame. Uh, the Indians blamed the white people, the white people blamed the Indians, but bottom line was that treaty never, never happened. So at that point, they decided the only thing to do, the settlers here in Marietta decided the only thing to do was to have yet another treaty. And this time, we would not go out there, we would have the Indians come in here to Fort Harm. And so the word went out that the Indians were to gather into the settlement and uh, uh, they would start arriving in September and then the treaty would be held after the first of the year. This would give them plenty of time to come in. And they had certainly hoped that the Shawnee would be among them. As it turned out, the Shawnee never came because the Shawnee had decided a long time ago not to trust the white man at all, that they couldn't believe anything he said and they just were not interested in signing a treaty that to them meant absolutely nothing. And, uh, but anyway, uh, several hundred of them did come in. And at that time, uh, St. Clair suffered terribly from gout. And gout being a very painful disease, I've been told it is so painful that you can't even stand the weight of a sheet on your foot. And uh, there were no painkillers. There wasn't any aspirin, Tylenol, whatever it is you take for pain. The only thing there was was alcohol. And of course, if you have a treaty writing on what you say and how you act, you don't want your mind clouded by alcohol. So poor St. Clair, he absolutely had nothing to uh, stop his pain. He just simply had to endure it as best he could. And uh, they say that he wasn't able to even take his boots off for days before the treaty. His feet were so very painful, and if he ever took them off, he'd never get them on. And the very day after all these Indians had gathered in, several hundred of them, and they were gathering into a special council house that had been built there at Fort Harmer. St. Clair still was in so much pain he couldn't stand to put his feet on the ground. And so he had his soldiers uh, carry him, seated in a chair, and the soldiers carried the chair to the council house. And the Indians, of course, did not realize this was because the leader was sick. They believed that the great white general was so great that he didn't... Uh, intend to put his feet on the ground, that his soldiers would carry him wherever he wanted to go. And they probably thought this was quite a kingly arrangement, so to speak. And uh, he carried through with the treaty uh, as best he could in spite of his pain. Uh, I really I really appreciate the endurance of people like that because that had to be a bit very difficult to concentrate when you knew how important this was and how much was writing on whatever was said and written there. And the treaty went along just as planned, except that the Shawnee never did come. But the ones that were there signed the treaty, and for a time being, it seemed as if everybody could breathe easy. The settlers thought this certainly would take care of everything. Now, whether St. Clair and Harbor and Putnam and all those men, whether they believed that or not, I imagine they had their doubts because it wasn't but just a few months after the treaty that it became very obvious that uh, the treaty really hadn't done what they hoped it would do. And of course, the reason for that being is that the Indians who did come in to sign the treaty, the rest of the Indians didn't necessarily feel that they spoke for them. And uh, besides, they didn't feel like, they didn't have the same concept either. That was another thing. The Indian did not have a concept of absolute ownership in the sense that the white man did. Uh, the Indian said that the earth belonged to the Great Spirit, and all of us were just passing through. That it would be impossible for us to own the earth because we're not going to take it with us when we go. And so to the Indian, this was a totally foreign concept. Well, of course, the Europeans, they had generations behind them where that you got a little piece of paper that said you owned this piece of land and no one else dared tread on it. So they understood this, but the Indians didn't. And so therefore, they would sign treaties saying not exactly what they thought it meant, you know what I mean? It was just kind of a concept that was beyond their comprehension. So many times they did not mean to be treacherous. They just didn't understand what the white man was asking of them. And of course the white man understood perfectly 
and just assumed that everybody else saw it the same way that he did. And uh, so, of course, this led to uh, continued skirmishes, people being taken prisoner, flatboats going up and down the river being fired upon, uh, surveyors being shot while they were surveying, uh, hunters being ambushed, cattle being stolen. So within just a few months after the treaty, it became obvious that the treaty wasn't working. And so they decided that General Harmer should get together a group of soldiers and go into Indian territory. They had figured out that the trouble spot was up on the, uh, in what is now uh, northwestern Ohio, up in that general area where the Shawnee and the Miami tribes, that that was the hot spot. The Delaware tribes up on the Tuscarawas and uh, the Iroquois spread throughout the area. They didn't seem to be the problem. It was that Miami Confederation up in there that seemed to be the hot spot. So they sent General Harmer up. The government decided to whether he would lead an expedition up there and just kind of settle down things. Well, it was a disastrous expedition. Um, eventually, he was turned back. The report that he sent in to the government offices sounded a lot better than it actually was. But for the time being, once again, everybody said, well, we hope this did it. Harmer did not believe this did it. He tried to tell people, uh, you know, we're fighting, uh, we're doing this the wrong way. I don't know what we're doing wrong, but it's not going to work. And, uh, but even so, all-out war had not occurred yet. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, where the Indians were located and how there was a great mix of Indians throughout the territory. Well, if you could just use your imagination here for the state of Ohio or the Marietta settlement and uh, think that to the south of them, they had the Shawnee. And as I've said so many times, they knew the Shawnee were their enemies forever and ever, that there was not going to be a treaty with the Shawnee. So they were very wary of going towards the south. They were very wary watching the Shawnee. They knew they were their enemies. Uh, the Iroquois, that mighty Iroquois confederation from the north, had been for the most part pro-British. And so the settlers here realized that they were certainly not friendly. They had been pro-British and they weren't going to be on the side of the settlers now. So they knew that there was trouble in that direction. Uh, over to the northwest in the Miami country, they knew there that the Miami Indians were their enemies, that the our confederation over there were against them. That's three sides, but they didn't think the Delaware and the Wyandotte and the Ottawa, they were still trading. They felt that they were still friendly with them. So they, they must have comforted themselves many times and said, well, we aren't completely surrounded after all, you know, we've only got Indians in these hot spots. But on the 2nd of January in 1791, that all changed. And this is how it changed. There had been a group of young men who left the Marietta settlement that fall and went up to Muskingum to a place called Big Bottom. And it was called Big Bottom just because it was wide, flat bottom lanes, wonderful farmland. Now, at this point, Harmer's expedition has failed. The treaty obviously didn't do what they hoped it would. So they know there's danger, and Rufus Putnam has cautious, cautioned people not to leave the major forts, to stay put around Fort Harmer, to stay put around Campus Martius, uh, to be very careful. But you see, these young people were not foolhardy, but they had land set aside up the uh, Muskingum River. And the agreement was you had to claim your land, you had to cultivate so many acres, you had to build a building, or you lost it, you forfeited your land. They applied for an extension once and got it, but by now their extension was going to run out. So they had, they had no choice but to either claim their land or take a chance on forfeiting. And, uh, you know, this was the only chance they had. And besides, this was land to the north where those friendly Indians were. And they felt safe in going up the river and building a blockhouse, not a fort, just a blockhouse. And uh, they would stay the winter. And then when spring came, they would be there on site. And every good day, even in the winter, they could clear brush and get ready. So that when spring came, they could make those improvements that was necessary to hold their claim. And that was their reasoning for doing this. And uh, so they went up along the river, up along the Miss Kingdom there at Big Bottom, and they built a blockhouse, just a big blockhouse. And there was about 17 of them all together. Well, 17 people in a blockhouse for a whole winter. All men except Isaac Meek's wife and two children. 
uh, that she was the only woman and the two children were the only children. But 17 people in a one room dwelling is just too much togetherness for some people. So a couple of brothers by the name of Bullard, Asa and Elisa, decided that uh, they just couldn't stand that. And so there was a little shed, maybe a trapper's shed, it was just a little fallen down shed, uh, a few feet north of the blockhouse, and they said, this is fine, we'll just move in there and spend the winter. And so that's what they did. They caulked up a few of the cracks in it, and they fixed it up till it was livable. And that's where they were going to spend the winter. Well, on the other side of the uh, block house, there was another uh, such lean-to of some kind. And uh, there were four fellows who had hunted together a lot. And uh, they were, Thomas Shaw was one of their names, and uh, uh, Chapman, I believe, was one name, and I forget the other two's names. But at any rate, those fellows had hunted together for a long time, and they were used to one another's company. And they decided that they couldn't stand all that togetherness in the blockhouse either, so they were going to build their little cabin over here. So at Big Bottom, we have this one cabin with four fellows in it. We have the main blockhouse with about a dozen people in it. And then we have the Bullard brothers over here. Well, uh, on this night in January, um, it's very, very bitterly cold, and there's heavy snow on the ground, and the wind's blowing. And oh, I might say that uh, at Christmas time that year, uh, a couple of boys that were there at Big Bottom, his name was Stacy, Philip and John, I believe their names were, and their father, old Colonel Stacy, from down uh, Marietta, from that um, oh, uh, Campus Marshes, had gone up to visit his sons. And now he was an old Indian fighter from way back. He had been in the revolution and he had stories to tell that would curl your hair. And he was appalled at the lack of security. He said, even the dogs are in here with the fire sleeping. And uh, he said, you know, your guns are in this corner and that corner. He said, nobody knows anything. You aren't posting a uh, guard outside at night and all. He just, he was just really upset with them. Well, they probably just kind of rolled their eyes and they said, well, there goes dad. You know how he worries and he's probably going to tell us another war story or something. And they didn't pay much attention to it. Well, he visited and then he went back to Campus Marshes where he was staying, but he was worried about his boys. And he tried to tell them that this, but they said, all oh, the Indians up here are friendly. We're miles away from the Shawnee. We're miles away from Iroquois. We're fine. Well, on this night, on the 1st of January, bitter cold, and of course, uh, conventional wisdom of that time had it that Indians would attack in the wintertime anyway. So they felt very, very safe. One of their uh, members, a fellow by the name of Will Smith, who normally would have been at Big Bottom, had gone to the mills at Waterford to have grain ground, and he was gone. And there were so many people ahead of him at the, at the mill that he couldn't get his grain ground on time, so he didn't get home when he thought he ought to. And he was sitting down there, kind of impatient, thinking, here I am, I, ought to, I ought to want to be back up home with my buddies at Big Bottom. But he was the only one that wasn't home that night. The rest of them were having a perfectly normal night, long about supper time. They were just cooking their evening meal over the fire. Meanwhile, the Indians are starting, there's a war party coming down in this kingdom on the ice. Their intention is to go down to the Belfry settlement and attack a Farmer's Castle. This is what they've got in mind. But as they come down to this kingdom, where they're going to cut across and go towards Belfry, they look this direction and they see smoke. They hadn't realized that the settlements had proceeded that far north. And when they saw the smoke, they became more angry than ever because this is another sign that they're breaking the treaty or moving farther north, and they decide to stop and wipe out that settlement first. The first stop is at the cabin where the Choke Brothers, that's their names, ones I couldn't remember. The Choke Brothers are staying with um, uh, Thomas Shaw and the other fellow. And so they walk in the cabin, and those four guys aren't even afraid. I mean, they've traded with these Indians and hunted with them. They know them. But they just talk long enough for the Indians to see where the guns are and just kind of size up the situation, and then the Indians take them prisoners. Without a sound, the four men find themselves prisoners, not killed because they don't want the shots to alarm the larger blockhouse. They take them prisoner. Somebody, the, some of the Indians hold them there at the, block, at the shack, and the others go to the blockhouse. They walk in the door, 
And the block house, the people at the block house are just like the, the people at the uh, cabin. They aren't afraid because these are Indians that they appear and they thought were friendly. They are just in the, in the position of getting their evening meal. Uh, one fellow by the name of Will James, big tall fellow, later identified because he was so big, uh, is just leaning over the fire, getting ready to take a piece of meat out and put it on his plate. Uh, another fellow is eating, another fellow's uh, working over here. It's just a very ordinary evening scene. And the Indians walk in, and man, I don't know what happened. Maybe they invited him to eat or whatever. But just that quick, the Indians opened fire on him so quickly that just as old Colonel Stacy had warned them, they didn't have time to get their guns, draw their knives or tomahawks. The only blow that was struck was by Mrs. Meeks, the uh, wife of the hunter, Isaac Meeks, who picked up an axe that was laying in the corner after she saw her two children killed. She picked up the axe and hit one of the Indians with it. That was the only blow that was struck. And the entire settlement was wiped out, except for young Philip Stacy, who hid under a pile of blankets in the corner. And the other Stacy boy made it to the roof. He went right out to a hole in the roof, but the Indians were watching for him outside and shot him before he could get down off the roof. Philip hid under the blankets in the corner, but when they went to searched the cabin they found him and took him prisoner. So now they have four prisoners and they have Philip. But the gunfire at this point has alerted the Ballard brothers, Asa and Eliezer, and they know what is happening. And they can tell from the gunfire that this is a large party of Indians. So there's no question of going to the rescue. This would be suicide. And so they strike out over land to get to Marietta and for it to uh, the settlement at Plainfield, which we now know as Waterford. Uh, to warn the settlers there that there's an Indian attack in process. They take off, and this, the Indians have not seen their cabin because it's a windy night, and you know how on a windy night the smoke tends to blow down? And so the wind is blowing the smoke from the Bullard brothers' cabin flat, and the Indians never even know that the cabin's there, so they don't even know that somebody got away. Well, they do get away, and they... Um, travel on a cross country till they hit Meg's Creek. When they hit Meg's Creek, they follow Meg's Creek into the Muskingum, which is frozen over, so they travel on the ice. Finally, they come to a campfire, but they don't know whether it's white man or an Indian. So they, yeah, I can just imagine, you know, how cold they must have been and how frightened they must have been. And so they slip up to this campfire and they get their guns at the ready before they hallow to wake the people up. But it turns out it's Captain Joseph Rogers from the Marietta Settlement, who is a scout and ranger for Campus Martius, and his Indian guide, an Indian by the name of Layton. Uh, his last name is Layton. And uh, so they tell them what's happened, and then the four of them come on down to Miss Kingham. They warn the settlers of Plainfield, who gather in. They don't even have a fort there because there's been no trouble in there. Again, like the ones at Big Bottom, they aren't afraid. So they haven't built any kind of a fort. They have one blockhouse there. Major Oliver, so they all gather in the Major Oliver's blockhouse. Block and at Plainfield, most of the men are in Marietta attending the quarter, quarter sessions. So uh, just about the only people at uh, the Wolf Creek settlement in Plainfield are the women, children, and a few men who did not come down to the quarter, the quarter sessions. Well, then they continue on down the river to warn the settlers in Marietta that an attack is in progress, and they don't know whether they're right behind them or where they are. So the next morning, and this is where the shock comes in, the Marietta settlers go back up to Big Bottom to see if there's any survivors. Of course there's not. They have burned the cabin, the bodies are all in there with the burning of the cab, the blockhouse, but they recognize the tracks of those moccasins and the Delaware warlands that's left in the snow as being the Delaware and the Wyandotte and the Ottawa. And now they know the Shawnee to the south of their enemies, the Miami to their west of the enemies, the Iroquois to the north are their enemies, and now the one remaining tribe, group of tribesmen that they have got who are not their enemy are. And so at this point, the settlers know they are completely surrounded by hostile Indians, and they don't know how many of them there are. It's been, they have estimated that there's probably, now whether they were right about this or not, but they believed that there was at least 10,000 warriors available among all those tribes. This was what was published in a, a journal that I read 
that that was what they believed. Whether there actually were that many or not, I'm not sure. I imagine there were with all those different tribes. But uh, there they were, out in the middle of a wilderness in the winter, very ill-prepared, surrounded by an untold number of hostile Indian forces, and they had no idea whether these people, uh, the Indians, whether they were uh, forming a confederation. They just really didn't know what was going to happen next, except they knew they were outmanned and outgunned at this point. And uh, at this point, where they built Fort Fry. And Fort Fry might not have been the biggest fort, but it sure was the fastest. And because they spent a long night there in Oliver's cabin after the Bullard brothers and uh, uh, Captain Rogers left, and their hearts must have been in their throat, literally, to think that they didn't know. And they could see, they heard the Indians prowling around later that night, but for some reason or other, the Indians didn't attack. They probably didn't know the men were all at Marietta, or they might have attacked. But uh, when daylight came, they set about building Fort Fry. Describe the scene at, at uh, Campus Martius then the next day. Didn't everybody sort of come into Campus Martius all of a sudden and bringing their, some of their belongings? And well, at that point, they knew it was time to go on full alert, yes. Yeah, well, you're probably referring to a time that happened later on when Joseph Rogers was killed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell that story. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, that happened fairly soon. After that the... happened not too long after that. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, while the settlers at Fort Fry were frantically getting ready to build their little triangular fort, and uh, uh, by the way, I might mention what a job it would be to build a fort in the dead of winter when the ground is frozen. What they did is they built fires at different intervals, wherever they were going to put a post, and the fire did two things. It thawed out the ground, and it also provided light so they could work day and night. And so they were starting under heavy guard to uh, cut trees, drag them in with their oxen, set the posts, and build this fort because they didn't know what minute out of the darkness was going to come another attack, just as it had at Big Bottom. And then meanwhile, these ambushes kept happening around over the different uh, uh, forts and different areas of the uh, settlement. Uh, at Marietta, there were two, uh, well, there was many rangers. I don't know whether I've been talked about the scouts and rangers. The theory of having scouts and rangers, each fort would have at least two and sometimes four. And these men would leave the settlement at daylight, and they would literally scout throughout a certain territory. Well, over here, you would have another fort, and their scouts would be scouting. If you had a map, you'd see how that they overlapped each other, and they would cover the wilderness, and it was their job to look for trouble. If they could stop trouble right on the spot, they were to stop it, however means they could. If they couldn't stop it, they were to get back to the fort and sound the alert, because the one thing that the settlers dreaded above all others was a surprise in the attack. And so these scouts, they were the ones that I spoke about before who were usually recruited from men who had grown up on the frontier and who really understood the wilderness and understood Indian ways. And certainly Captain Joseph Rogers was one who understood the Indians and understood the wilderness. And his uh, companion, his fellow scout at that particular time, was a fellow by the name of Edward Henderson. Edward was called Ned. And uh, Edward, well, I'll talk a little bit more about him later on. He was a very interesting man in many ways. But anyway, Joseph Rogers, the night before this happened, he had had a dream. And he was usually a very talkative, friendly, outgoing man. And at breakfast that morning before he and Ned went out on the trail, he was very quiet. And somebody asked him, what's the matter? And he said, I had a dream last night. He said, I know today I'll either lose a scalp or take one. And they said, if you feel that way, why go out? And he said, that's my job. That's what I do. And so he went. Uh, they patrolled the area, which would probably be, uh, oh, I don't know, out in the general area of 821 from Marietta, uh, making a big circle over the hills uh, north of Marietta. And uh, it was an ordinary day. They didn't see anything out of the ordinary. And I'm imagining that probably... Uh, Joseph's dream bothered him off and on during the day, but maybe it kind of wore off as the day went on since it was such an ordinary day. And just as they were coming back 
headed home out the ridge north of um, uh, Fort uh, Campus Marshes, probably about where the Marietta Senior High School is today. You know, when I study the map, I think that must be the ridge that they followed. When they came out that ridge where the high school is today, without any warning at all, out of the bushes, quicker than you could bat your eye, three or four Indians stepped and fired all right at the same time. Joseph Rogers was in head, and he took pretty much a full shot right to the front of him. He went down, but not before he had enough voice, enough life left in him to tell Ned to run for his life. Well, he didn't have to tell Ned to run for his life. He was all set to run for his life as soon as this happened. But the Indians were between him and the fort. Well, they were expecting him, of course, to try to run away from them, which would be the natural thing. But Ned, who could think really fast, turned around and charged right into him and went through the line of the Indians and headed around in a curve toward Duck Creek with them after him, running in a zigzag pattern so they couldn't hit him. By this time, it was dark because they had just been coming in as the day had ended. And so now it was pitch black, it's dark, he's running through the heavy woods. Uh, he doesn't know what's ahead of him, but he does know that there's four Indians firing behind him. At one point, a rifle ball goes past him so close that he has a handkerchief tied around his head that it cuts the handkerchief loose from his head. That's how close it comes to him. Uh, but he gets away from them, and he makes it as far as Duck Creek, and he hides in the bushes there. Well, Duck Creek flows down into the Ohio River eventually. And so when he doesn't hear any more of the uh, Indians after him, he very carefully and quietly makes his way down Duck Creek, follows Duck Creek to the Ohio River. Then he follows the Ohio River up to Fort Harmer and sounds the alarm. And this is where the story that you've heard comes in about how the people rushed into the fort. Uh, carrying what they their dearest belongings. And so the alarm goes out. Well, each fort would have a set signal. In Fort Harmer's case, it was the sound of the cannon. If you didn't have a fort, it was gunfire, three shots. They would have a prearranged signal so you would know the emergency. So anyway, they let the signal fly and everybody came rushing into the fort. And it was interesting to uh, hear what they brought. The old, remember old Edmund Moulton, the goldsmith, who was the oldest man to come with the Ohio Company men? They said as he came running up the path to the fort, they could hear clank, 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 because he had his goldsmith's apron with all his tools tied around him. That was the dearest thing he had, and he risked his life to bring them with him. But, you know, even as we smile at that, we think this was the man's living. You know, if he didn't have a means to make a living on the frontier, Hey, there wasn't anything else there for him. It was worth his life to save his tools. Uh, Mother Moulton, his wife, she didn't come right away, but her daughter Lydia came. And Lydia, by the way, was a goldsmith in her own right, which was kind of unusual for those days. And Lydia came with the family Bible under one arm and the teapot in the other. Those were her treasured possessions. And Mother Moulton still wasn't there. And they must have said, oh my goodness, what happened to her? Is she dead on the trail? What had, did the Indians get her? But no, Mother Moulton came a few minutes later and she said that she had to tidy up the house. She couldn't leave it looking so. And so she was a dedicated housekeeper, a really dedicated housekeeper. Uh, other people, Ebenezer Sprout, for example, came with a great sheaf of some kind of official papers. You know, he was Marietta's sheriff and entrusted with various bookkeeping duties. So he had all his valuable papers. But it's just kind of... Um, uh, kind of scary and kind of interesting to think what you would take if you had to run for your life in the middle of the night. And they do say that on the frontier, those who chose to live outside the fort, and you could live outside the fort, this wasn't compulsory. You could live outside the fort knowing that at any moment you might have to, night or day, you might have to run for your life. And they said you could wake a very small child on the frontier and whisper in its ear, and the child would know not to make a sound because you had to get up and run quietly and fast and pray that they weren't between you and the fort. No saddling the horses, no dressing, no anything. Grab what you have and go. They said that night, one young woman came into the fort dragging her screaming child by the hand and her feather bed under her arm. So uh, a long night passed. They gathered in with their children and their prized possessions and they waited 
and waited and waited for the attack that didn't come. And at dawn, they went out to retrieve the body of Joseph Rogers, who indeed had been killed uh, there on the ridge back of, uh, as I say, I think where the scene high would be today. And uh, so that, that gives you an idea of the state of alert that people lived in. As we've talked so many times, fear is something that it's hard for us to comprehend unless we've lived in that kind of a condition. Even men who have been in battle, men who have fought in the various wars, a uh, tour of duty is seldom longer than 18 months. And if you think a tour of duty on the battlefield, 18 months at war, this makes a man a veteran. But how would you like to live your entire life like that? As many on the Pennsylvania border and the New York border and in the Ohio Valley would live uh, for so many years that way. Now, here in the Marietta area, the Indian Wars were only to last a few years until Anthony Wayne's battle. But uh, behind that, there were years and years of this fighting. Um, you know, I talk about it as a great cultural tragedy of two groups of people, white and Indian, both very sure that they're right and both very sure that the other person is dangerous and terrible not to get them. And that you have two groups of people fighting for their lives against each other. It was total warfare that is just really difficult for us to understand from our 21st century perspective. Okay, we're rolling. Well, there's many things that we'll never really know, you know, that happened back then. We can only give it our best guess or draw conclusions. One of the things that all has fascinated me ever since I started reading history is uh, this is how people react to situations, you know. No two people, white or Indian, reacted to any situation the same way. Uh, case in point, there were three boys. And children were often kidnapped by the Indians, by the way, and taken in and raised and became uh, members of the Indian tribes. One of the things that interests me is you find many, many cases where this will happen and the, the child that was kidnapped does not want to go back to its people. Many people, many of the European settlers voluntarily joined Indian tribes. I have seldom found where an Indian voluntarily came over and stayed with the whites. It was just kind of one of those things that didn't happen. But there were three boys that always, the, their histories fascinate me. Uh, one is very well known. His name was Lou Wetzel. And uh, he became a legend on the frontier, a legend in his own time. He was, depending on how you looked at it, a psychopathic killer of Indians or a great hero. Now, it depends on how you look at it, because had I been out there in a cabin in the wilderness, surrounded by hostile Indians, I would have wanted Blue Wetzel on my side. Looking at it from a 21st century point of view, he probably killed a lot of innocent people. I'm sure he did. But let's look at his background. Uh, when he was just a boy, I don't know, 9, 10, 12 years old, he and his brother Jacob were taken prisoner by the Indians. And uh, they were marched for several days. They were not brutally treated. They were somewhat, he felt like he was mistreated. Uh, but uh, at any rate, he managed to escape from the Indians. And his escape in itself was quite a long story because he managed not only to get him and his little brother, who were both just young boys, away from the entire group of grown warriors, and not only escape, but when he got out in the brush and discovered that he didn't have any decent moccasins, he told his little brother to wait, and he sneaked back into camp and stole two pairs of moccasins and a gun and came back, got his brother, and they made their way back to the Wheeling settlement. And on the way, he vowed that he would kill every Indian across his path from that day forward, and he did. He didn't ask questions whether they were friendly Indians, honest Indians. He didn't. He was a loose cannon if ever there was one but he was a famous Indian fighter, quite a formidable fellow. Uh, his physical description alone would have frightened you out of your wits, I think. They said he was about five foot nine. He never cut his hair, they said. He said that if ever an Indian got his scalp, it was going to be worthwhile. And they said if his hair was let down, it reached the back of his knees. It was that long. So he wore his hair up around his head. He had pierced ears, pierced nose. 
And they said his eyes were black and glittering, and the Raven people who said they glowed in the dark like a panther, so although I think that was probably a slight exaggeration. But he was a formidable man, and in any way you look at it, he was an Indian fighter and a killer of Indians. His life was never the same after his captivity by the Indians. He was completely changed. From what we know now of child psychology, we know that these early experiences can really change a person. And the second boy was a boy by the name of Simon Gertie, who also became very well known on the frontier. Simon Gertie was also taken prisoner by the Indians when he was a little boy, and he had an even worse experience than Lou Wetzel, because when Simon was taken prisoner, his stepfather and his mother and his two brothers were taken prisoner with him, and he watched his stepfather die at the stake. This was a horrible experience. I don't have to tell anyone that, but this was a horrible experience for a young boy to see something like this happen before his very eyes. He and his mother and his brothers were separated for a time. He was raised by the Indians. Uh, when he became uh, a little older, he escaped from the Indians and went back to the whites and traveled with the whites as a scout and ranger. I told you a little bit ago about Captain Pipe and how the man by the name of Edward Hand had led a militia into Captain Pipe's village and slaughtered a bunch of Indian women and children. Simon Gurney was a scout of that expedition with Captain Edward Hand. When he saw what happened to the Indian village, he must have come to the conclusion that the whites were as savage as the Indians. And one biographer said Simon Gurney walked no more with the white man after that. He went back and fought with the Indians. He was, in his way, as much of a killer of India, of a fighter as Lou Wetzel, only he fought against the whites. So we have Lou Wetzel and Simon Gurdy, who had very similar experiences, horrific experiences for a young boy. Nobody would deny that. And one fought against the Indians, and one fought against the whites. Very different reactions for a very similar background. The third young boy's name was Joe Kelly. And Joe Kelly lived at the Belleville settlement downriver on the Virginia shore, a few miles downriver from Marietta. There's still a settlement down there. And Joe and his father went out one morning to work in the cornfield. They were attacked by Indians. Joe was about seven or eight years old. And his father was tomahawked before his eyes. And he was taken prisoner by the Indians. He was marched clear across the state of Ohio, clear up to the Great Lakes, where he was traded and bought and switched back and forth to the many tribes of Indians. He finally wound up with an Indian family that he grew to love. And he loved the Indian life. He was a big, tall boy and a fast runner. He, uh, his name and his Indian family was something that sounded like Lalekwi, which meant the tall runner. And it, he could beat any of the Indian boys in a foot race. He was as fast as any of them, faster than most of them. And he lived a long time up there with the Indians until after the Treaty of Greenville was signed and there were these prisoner exchanges. And, uh, uh, he didn't want to come back. In fact, he hid from the, his Indian family hid him because they didn't want to give him up. He loved them and they loved him. And so Jonathan Meggs, who was uh, one of the men from the Marietta settlement, went on hunt of him because his mother, of course, wanted him to come back. He was a young man by this time, uh, probably a, in his late teens. And Jonathan Meggs finally found him and they took him away from his Indian family and brought him back to the people in Marietta. Now think of this, in a, as I say, from what we know of child psychology today. Think of a little boy, seven or eight years old, seeing his father murdered before his eyes. Think of him being taken clear across country, sold, uh, changed, different tribes, different languages, different territory. He forgot his native tongue. He couldn't speak English when they finally found him. Then when he's an adolescent, right at the most um, one of the most turning points of a young man's life, he is ripped out of a society that he has learned to love and he's finally adjusted to, and he's required to adjust all over again. Well, do you know Joe Kelly did it? He adjusted quite well. He relearned his English language. He uh, learned the trade of a carpenter. He married. He raised a family. He lived in Marietta up on 4th Street. Uh, many people in the Marietta area know uh, Newt Burt Duvall, uh, who was a school teacher in the Marietta schools, and Burt's wife was a descendant of Joe Kelly. Joe and his family are buried there in Mound Cemetery. Uh, 
he had a horrific experience, but he lived a completely normal life afterwards. Now, I always ask myself, we have three little boys who had an experience that no child should ever have to endure. One, two became killers. One against Indians, one against whites, and one appeared to come out of a, out of a psychological scratch, lived a perfectly normal life. In fact, years later, after the Indian Wars were over and the Indians were uh, completely gone out of the territory, uh, Indians came back to hunt up their old childhood friend, La Lakeway, the runner. And uh, the story goes that they met him down at the, uh, where the Hotel Lafayette is today, down at the point, and they challenged him to a foot race. They said, La Lakeway, we are all old men now. Can you still beat us as you did when we were boys? And so they ran from uh, the point up to Campus Marshes. And yes, while Lakeway was an old man, but he beat them even as he had when they were boys together on the Great Lakes. So that is, that is one of the stories that uh, uh, always makes me wonder why. And this is okay. Okay. Well. Uh, many times uh, I'm asked, what about the women on the frontier? Because most of the information we have comes from journals and diaries and records that are kept by men. And so therefore, we know more about the men's activities than we do the women. And I always tell them it's kind of like uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. You know, you hear a lot about Fred, you don't hear a lot about Ginger. But the thing you got to remember is Ginger did everything Fred did, only she did it high heels and backwards. And that's just a little bit about the way the uh, pioneer women were. They did practically everything the men did, only they did it with certain handicaps. If you look at their lifespan you will uh, realize that most of the pioneer women were either pregnant or taking care of small children as they traveled. And so when you read about your pioneer grandmother coming down the river on a flatboat and hiking across this mountain and that mountain and up this hill and that hill, chances are she had a child in her arms and one by her side and another on the way. And uh, but that's very seldom ever, ever recognized. Many times we will read accounts of pioneer women where the, uh, they travel and then two or three days after the most horrendous journey, they give birth to a child. And uh, this is just the way things were done. For example, there was Elizabeth Cushing who comes to mind who came with the first families in August. After the men had come in April, the first families arrived in August. And Elizabeth Cushing came down the same route as the men pioneers had come. She'd come across the Allegheny by oxen. She had come down the river on a flat boat. And uh, not much is said about Elizabeth, but from looking at history, by hindsight and looking at records, we know several things. We know that Elizabeth had a desperately ill child in her care during this length of time because her daughter, Nabby, died three days after they got here. So all that trip, she made the journey with a child that she knew was right at death's door. We know that Elizabeth was also pregnant because a few months after that, she gave birth to her sixth child. And, uh, I, but not much else is told about her. She went ahead about her daily life just as if, um, just as if she was living a life of ease, so to speak. The diseases of women I find very interesting because uh, lung disease was one of the great scourges of women at that time. Now, we generally think of uh, lung cancer today, especially as a man's disease. But the back then, lung, now whether it was uh, emphysema, whether it was cancer, what it was, but lung disease killed a great many women. And we ask ourselves why, and then we think about the chores that they did from the time she was a little girl, the woman was bent over the fireplace, breathing the fumes and breathing the smoke. And so it's easy to see why that, that would be one of the things that would plague her. On the other hand, uh, gout and things that bothered the men did not bother her because many times, thinking she was doing her husband a good deed, she would save the meat for him and she would drink the broth and eat the vegetables where if there was any meat, protein, she would see that the men folks and the children of the family got it instead of her. And so that much was, was very, very different. The women were as different as the men were different. Now we spoke of Elizabeth Cushing, who by every uh, record I've ever had, was a very strong woman. 
who uh, bore up under the rigors of the frontier without batting an eye, so to speak. And uh, in contrast to her, we have Mrs. Armstrong, who lived at the Belper settlement. And I found one account where it said her first name was Nancy, but I'm not real sure of that. Anyway, uh, she was married to a man who had a mill who wanted to move across on the Virginia shore. And uh, Mrs. Armstrong was a child of the Pennsylvania frontier, and she had seen her family killed by the Indians in Pennsylvania, and she was terrified of Indians. I mean, she was just literally terrified, did not want to leave the safety of Farmer Castle. And she had several children, and she didn't want to take them and leave the security, but her husband was adamant that they should move over to the Virginia shore and uh, where he could better attend his mill. They said that poor Nancy was so reluctant to leave the security of Farmer's Castle that her husband had to forcibly remove her hands from the door jam in order to get her across into the canoe and across the river. And indeed, about three or four months after she moved across the river, her worst nightmare came true, and she and her and several of her children were killed by the Indians, and three of her children taken prisoner. So we know that poor Nancy Armstrong lived in fear and terror of the frontier. By contrast, Rebecca Williams, the wife of Isaac Williams, who settled Williamstown across the river from the Marietta settlement, loved the frontier. She was, uh, had been born in the Pittsburgh Wheeling area. She had married a man by the name of Martin, quite young. Martin was killed. He was a, I believe he was a traitor or a scout. He was killed by Indians, and she was a widow by the time she was 16. And uh, married Isaac Williams not too long after that. And she loved the frontier all the days of her life and was never afraid of anything. Uh, the story goes that uh, when she lived at Williamstown, if she wanted to go visit her sister in Wheeling, she would get a canoe and she would go right up the Ohio River paddling by herself with her rifle with her and take care of herself. When night came, she would uh, pull into shore, up turn her canoe, crawl under it and go to sleep. In the morning, she'd get back on the river and go to wherever she wanted to go. And uh, there's no record that she was ever afraid or that she ever had any qualms about the frontier. And when she was a very old lady, and it looked like she wasn't going to live very much longer. She said she didn't want to be buried in the cemetery with everybody else. She wanted to be buried out on the family farm where she had plenty of elbow room. She didn't want to be jostled at the resurrection. And uh, so, so they were uh, very con much contrast among the women of the frontier. They, the ones, the New England women, of course, tried to perpetuate their social life that they had known back in New England. We find many um, uh, references to the uh, wives at Fort Harmer and the, the officers' wives and the New England ladies from uh, the settlers over at Campus Marshes meeting and having tea. Uh, they had parties and balls and uh, various social things to the point where they felt like they had quite an active little circle going. Of course, the uh, wives of the officers' wives and the wives of people like Rufus Putnam and Ben Tupper, uh, they were, uh, they were, I think they were very class conscious as opposed to the way we think now. Uh, the frontiersmen's wives would be of a different class and they would travel in different social circles. Uh, as I told you about um, Mrs. Theory a little while ago, the French lady. They found her rather shocking because she didn't behave as a you know, proper New England lady should. So there was a certain amount of class consciousness among the women as there was among the men. The officers, the enlisted men, the scouts, the rangers, uh, there was all, all different types of people, men as well as women. Is that covered? Yeah. Okay. Okay, any movement, any exploration, or any settlement always um, comes in for a fair share of criticism. And of course, Rufus Putnam and the men of the Ohio Company are no exception. They've had their fair share, maybe more than their fair share of criticism, being accused of land speculating and things of that sort. And I'm sure to a degree that was probably true. Uh, anytime you have a million and a half acres of land involved, people are bound to use some rather rough tactics or tactics that do seem rough to other people. And another thing that uh, comes up that uh, we need to mention is the difference in concept of land. We've touched on that between the Indians and the white. 
because the people who explored the Ohio country and moved farther west truly believed that the country was up for grabs and uninhabited in spite of the fact that the Indians were living there. And there's a basic difference in philosophy here that I think we haven't touched on that we need to, is that the Indian would look at the land and he would say, in effect, this is the land that my fathers have been on for generations and we have not touched it. It is just as nature left it. We've scarcely left a track in the forest. This was his philosophy. The white man, the European, comes along and he looks at the land and he says, the Indians haven't done anything with it. They must not want it. I, will I love the land, so I will plow so many acres, and I will cut down so many trees, and I will build different houses. The Indian looked at the white man, and he said, he's desecrating the land. The white man looked at the Indian and said, he's ignoring the land. And so you have this clash, and it could never, I mean, it was, you just could never reconcile those two viewpoints. And I think that is really... Uh, what led to a lot of the atrocities on both sides. And the uh, accusation of land speculation, of course, was because they thought there was all this free land from sea to shining sea. But basically, uh, what happened uh, in Marietta and in the Washington County, the Ohio Company purchase area, was that we have men who are visionaries. They have come into a new country. And right or wrong, they see it as open for settlement. And so they have this vision, but uh, the Ohio Company put the vision into motion. They devised a practical way of actually setting it up and making it happen. They took the ordinance of 1787 and they made it work. Uh, they took the situation as they found it and they made a way for education, for religion, uh, for uh, life, for daily life to be carried on. And I think maybe that was their, their greatest contribution because it's one thing to have a mighty vision, but as we all know, mighty visions aren't easily put into motion. And that's what they did in the, with the Ohio country. They were able to uh, take the vision and give it legs, as it were, and heart. Speak about why Marietta was not a large city. Well, I don't really know why Marietta wasn't a large city, why it didn't develop as Cincinnati, simply uh, because it's got the same uh, opportunities as Cincinnati. My theory has always been that perhaps they saw Marietta more as a toehold of uh, the frontier, uh, as a way to move into the center of the country, and perhaps they didn't really want a great metropolis that they wanted, remember when we started talking, we said that they were going to take these wonderful little New England villages that they had known back on the East Coast, and they were going to pick them up, as it were, and transplant them over into a new country. And they didn't want the problems of a huge settlement. They wanted law and order. And law and order was the watchwords of the Federalists. Remember those Federalists believed in a strong central government and they wanted things to be done very properly. And I think at the time when the uh, uh, Fort Harbor, finally, the soldiers left Fort Harbor and moved to uh, Fort Washington, which is now Cincinnati, I think at that time, probably Marietta's future was determined and Cincinnati's future was determined because uh, Cincinnati began to grow and became more of a thriving center. And Marietta, of course, as you know, has not grown all that much in spite of the oil boom and things that we had at the turn of the century.